Amen. So this morning we're continuing on with our series that we're going through on Sunday mornings. Um, just going through that Baptist acronym, you know, B-A-P-T-I-S-T, um, which is basically, when you break it down, just goes through and uh, is what most people would call the Baptist distinctive. So the series is called Distinctive Doctrines. And what we're going through are doctrines that when you walked into a Baptist church, you would expect uh, that church to believe. These are not unique to this church or any one particular church, but this, these are beliefs that we have as Baptists in general. You should be able to walk into, again, any Baptist church and ask them, do you believe this? And hear them say, yes, we believe in the, uh, in the, in the, the inspiration of the Bible. We believe in biblical authority. We believe in the autonomy of the local church. And today we've weighed our way down to the priesthood of the believers. And that's what we're going to talk about. Of course, that's that third letter in that acronym, if you're familiar with it, the BAP, the P stands for the priesthood of the believers. And as I've been thinking about this series and thinking about the different topics that we're going to cover, this one really has probably uh, stood out to me the most. I think you know, this is just a really unique one. This is really something I think a lot of people take uh, for granted. This is, or some people never really fully understand what exactly it means to be a, a priest in the faith or, to be, or what it means to be, at, because you are a believer, that you are a member of a you are a spiritual priest. It's, and it's really a great privilege that we have as New Testament believers to be able to act, and act, uh, act on the behalf as priests uh, in, before the very throne of God. So this, basic, this doctrine basically just breaks down a, a, as this. It's the belief that all believers have direct access to God. That you and I as born-again Christians, you and I as, as those that have put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that we have direct access to the very throne of God himself. We don't need a human intermediary between, uh, between, you, uh, 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 between ourselves and God. We don't need to go to some man and ask him to act on our behalf uh, for, go uh, uh, for God. We don't need him to go and say, well, I'm going to stand between you and God and act as the intermediary. I'm going to be the mediator between you and God. And you say, well, why is that important? Oh, I don't know, because there's entire religions that, that practice that. That will say, oh, you can't come to God, you have to come through a man. Mm -hmm. And so this is a very important doctrine. And it's one that we, we should not take for granted. It's one that we should exercise, in fact, in our lives. Uh, <clears throat> and the Old Testament, it, it, uh, it, the Old Testament priests, as you saw there in Hebrews chapter 10, are a picture of our spiritual priesthood. Uh, <clears throat> the, the priest acted, they acted as such as, as an intermedi intermediary. If you recall there in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says, the law having a shadow of things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. So it says the things of the law are a shadow of the things which were to come. They were not the very image of those things. So they were a picture of what was to come. What was to come is, was the, the, the real deal. That was the, the, the authentic thing. That was what the goal was. It, that, if I were to stand in front of a light source and cast my shadow, the Old Testament's the shadow. I would be the New Testament. It's that object that stands in the light source that is illuminated. That is what we are to be looking to. And the Old Testament tells is, is a shadow of things to come. And that includes the priesthood. The priesthood is a picture of things to come. And that pic what it pictures is, is the New Testament believer's priesthood. And really we could see several things in the Old Levitical priesthood that uh, picture the New Testament priesthood of the believer. <clears throat> now, of course, the priests, they acted as such intermediaries in their time, didn't they? They were a go-between between between God and man. They offered sacrifices on behalf of the people. In the Old Testament, you'd have to bring your sacrifice year by year continually, and those sacrifices would be offered by the priest. They would burn it on the altar. They would sprinkle the blood. They would keep the tabernacle. They were the ones that kept the temple later. And they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They, they did all, of, all of the ceremony that took place there. That was all done by the sons of Levi. No, and nobody else was allowed to do that. And then, of course, we understand that Christ, he came and he offered himself as a sacrifice. And he sprinkled his own blood. Because, again, those Old Testament sacrifices were, always have been, just a picture of what was to come. Those were, the, when they were offering those sacrifices, they understood it was not those particular sacrifices that were saving them, but they understood by faith that that was a picture of what was to come, the sacrifice, as Abraham said, that God would provide himself a lamb. <coughs> so, of course, Christ came being that lamb. He offered himself as a sacrifice. He sprinkled his own blood upon the altar. And why did he do that? Not only to save us from hell, not only to pay the penalty for sin, but also 
so that we could have direct access to the throne of grace. <clears throat> and our standing in Christ gives us that access. Because we are saved, because we are born again, because we are in Christ, we have access to the very throne of God. <clears throat> so again, the Old Testament, the priesthood, is just a foreshadowing of those things to come. The coming of Christ, His sacrifice, and Him making the, coming, uh, the comers there unto Him perfect in His blood. <clears throat> so the Old Testament priesthood, of course, is a picture of the New Testament believer's priesthood. And there's a lot of different things that we can look at about the Old Testament priesthood, which is what I'd like to do to begin with. And if you would, turn over to Leviticus chapter 21. We'll start to see some things about the Old Testament priesthood that are a picture of the New Testament believer's priesthood. And that they should be an encouragement to us and they should be a reminder to us about uh, the priesthood that we have in Christ. Of course, there in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 17, the Bible says, Speak unto Aaron, saying, Whosoever he be of thy seed in their generation that hath any blemish, let him not approach to the offer of the bread of God. Verse 18, For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. A blind man, or a lame, or he that had a flat nose, or any, su any superfluous, or any man that is broken-footed, or broken-handed, or crook-backed, or a dwarf, or that a blemish in his eye, or be, uh, a, or be scurvy, or scabbed, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, uh, the priest, shall come nigh unto the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish. blemish. He shall not come nigh to the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of, uh, of his God, both of the most holy and, and, and of the holy. Only he shall not go in unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane my, not my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, do sanctify him. So the Lord, of course, here is telling them that, look, if there's, you know, the, the priesthood res was reserved to the sons of Levi. They're the only tribe that was allowed to minister in the tabernacle to offer the sacrifices. But if there were any one of those men that had any kind of a blemish, we read that there, you know, any one of these things that, 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 uh, that the Bible lists, he was not allowed to come near unto the altar. He was not allowed to go into the most holy place. He was not going to be a high priest. He was not going to off offer the sacrifices of, a, of his God. And why is it? Because he has a blemish. And as that, that's a picture of, of us today. Not that we have a blemish, but that we do not have a blemish. We had a blemish when we were lost in sin. When we were unsaved, we were blemished. We were all of these things, not physically, but spiritually. We had the stain of sin upon us. And we were, we were all of these things. But now we are, we are sanctified in Christ. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, I'll read to you, Husband, love, hus love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, having not, spot, ha, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So in Christ, we are presented to God perfect, faultless. We do not have a blemish in Christ. And that is what the Old Testament is. You say, why was God just picking on, on these poor uh, disfigured people? Just because God's up there just like some maniacal, like a kid with a magnifying glass roasting ants. And he's just picking on people. No, there's a picture here. There's something that we should look to these things in Scripture and try to understand. That, that if we have a blemish, we cannot approach unto God. And here's the thing. All have, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that's why we need Christ to come and to cleanse us and to sanctify us. Why? So that he can pre present us before God's throne without a blemish. Not only did, they, uh, did the Old Testament priests, could they not have a blemish, they also had to have proof of their genealogy. If you would, turn over to Ezra chapter 2. Ezra chapter 2. Again, the Old Testament priesthood is a picture of the New Testament believer's priesthood. We see, first of all, it's a picture in the fact that they had to be without blemish, just as we must be without blemish today and are made without blemish in Christ. Not only that, but they had to have a proof of their genealogy. They had to be able to tell you what their, uh, their lineage was. They had had their family tree in order. They had to go and do 23 and me and, and present the results to you, right? So Ezra in tw uh, chapter 2, look at verse 61. And the children of the priests, the children of Habiah, uh, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite, was called after their name. Now, if you recall, of course, in the time of Ezra, this is when they're coming back into the captivity. They're setting up the walls. They're setting up the temple. They're starting to get the priesthood in order. And the children of the priests, of the children of Habiah, uh, the children of Kaz, the children of Barzillai, which took a wife of the daughters of Barzillai the Gileadite, were called, was called after their name. So they're taking a roll call. 
These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy. So they're looking for their records to prove that they are the sons of Levi. <clears throat> but they found not, therefore. They said, well, we can't find our records. We, we don't know what happened. They got lost when we got taken into captivity. Whatever. Some, somehow they got lost in the captivity. They, they, they weren't kept track of. So they could not come, and they were not found. Therefore, they could not prove Although many, many, maybe people probably said, well, yeah, I remember your dad. I remember your granddad. And we, it was only been 70 years. It's only been a, a couple generations. We all know them, but they could not prove it, could they? They had no record to prove that, that that's who they were of. <clears throat> and it says there, because they were found not, therefore they were, uh, were they as polluted and put from the priesthood. They say, well, if you can't prove your genealogy, you can't be a priest. It goes on, it says there, and the Tershatha uh, 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 said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. So they were put out from the priesthood and said, look, no proof. Sorry, you, can't be, you cannot come before the throne of God. You can't come to God's uh, sanctuary. You can't come and offer the sacrifices. You can't go into the holy place. <clears throat> so they were put out of the priesthood because the, that was reserved for the Levites exclusively. And they had to be able to prove that. Now, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 7, I'll read to you, and verily they that are the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood. So again, it's only that specific group that's allowed to, to take part in the priesthood. And these men could not prove that they were of that, that, uh, that priesthood. And there's a lot of other verses that, you know, I think we all understand that. <coughs> but you say, well, how does that apply us to us today? We'll turn over to John chapter 3. You see, we had the same thing. We have to be able to prove our genealogy. If you want to go to heaven, if you want to stand before God's throne, you have to have a certain lineage. You have to have been born in a certain line. And I'm not talking about a physical line. You know, some people would have us to believe, you know, about the, 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 the nation of Israel over there today. They'd say, well, they get a pass. They don't have to. They can reject Christ. You know, they can say blasphemous things against Christ. And it's okay because they're of a certain lineage. I'm not so, my friend. This is the New Testament. You know, and it's never been that way in the Old Testament. It's always been by faith. And that's a whole other sermon in and of itself. But the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, you're going to uh, John 3, it says, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the Bible says right there, if you do not have the Spirit of Christ, you are not of God. If you have, and he that hath not the Son hath not the Father. You know, so you can't say, oh, we all, they all worship the same God. Well, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father, the Bible says. The Bible says there in John chapter 3, well, how, how do I have the Spirit of Christ? How, is it, how, what, how do I get the genealogy right? I want to go to heaven. I want to stand before God's throne. I want to be a priest of God. How do, I, how do I get that? John chapter 3, look at verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Verily I say unto thee, Except a man be born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. That's the genealogy you need today. That's the birth that you have to have. That's the, 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 the heritage that you need to be able to point to when you stand before God and, and show the record. And you say, well, why should I let you into heaven? What, where, where's your proof? You know, what, 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 who do you hail from? Well, I'm born again in Christ. Amen. That's my genealogy. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I've been born of the Spirit. You become God's child. The Bible says, as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. When we believe on Christ, when we receive Him, we become the children of God. And we have that spiritual genealogy. We have that proof of the genealogy that we can enter into that spiritual priesthood that we have access to today. So we see that the Old Testament pr uh, priesthood is a picture of the New Testament uh, uh, believers' priesthood because they were without blemish and because they had a proof of genealogy just as we are today in Christ. We, have that, uh, we are without blemish in Christ. We have that proof of genealogy in Christ. But not only that, if you would turn over to Exodus, I should have had you stay there. And when you get there, keep something in Exodus. Exodus chapter 28. Exodus 28, another picture that we see in the Old Testament priesthood of our New Testament priesthood is the fact that they had to wear special garments. They couldn't just show up wearing whatever. You know, they, there were specific things that God wanted them to put on. 
<clears throat> it says in Exodus chapter 28, verse 1, And he said, And take unto thee Aaron thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments uh, for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all the wise hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. Verse 43, go ahead and jump down to verse 43. And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his son. So if you were to read, the, the, of course, the context of the chapter, he describes all those things very specifically. The color, the manner in which they were to be made, and how they were to be worn. And he tells them everything they were to put on, these special garments that they were to wear as priests of God. And it says in verse 43, And they shall be upon Aaron and upon his sons when they come into the tabernacle of the congregation, or when they come near unto the altar to minister in the holy place, that they bear not iniquity and die. It shall be a statute forever unto them and his seed after him. So he's saying, look, he wasn't just putting these clothes on them just so that they could look pretty. You know, because he just wanted to look a certain way. He put it in the clothes on him. So why? These garments were there so they would not bear iniquity and die. He said, they're going to put these on and it's going to sanctify them. It's going to show me that they, they are, you know, they're, they're wearing the garments that only they're allowed to wear. And it was so that they would not bear their iniquity and die. <coughs> so you say, well, how does that apply to us today? Well, if we recall the, the, uh, the, the parable that Jesus Christ gave in Matthew chapter 22, about going at the, 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 the uh, king that prepared a, a, uh, a wedding and the, the, wanted to invite the, the, those that were bidden would not come. And of course, then he goes out and he sends out others into the highways and byways and the hedges and it compels them to come to his house that his house may be full to the wedding there. And it says that when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. Right? So you say, that guy in this parable, he was supposed to have a special garment on. And he saith unto him, Friend! So he even calls him friend. So it's not, it, wasn't, it wasn't that God disliked this guy. He says, friend, how camest th uh, thou in hither not having a, a wedding garment? And he was speechless. He didn't know what to say. He got caught. You know, he shows up. Everybody else has got the wedding garments on. He's just kind of standing out like a, like a sore thumb. Mm -hmm. and, th and then he gets called on the carpet. And I've had this happen personally. You know. mm -hmm. I've gone, I remember going to a wedding one time and, and, and just thinking, well, you know, it's, I'm not, I, I could dress down a little bit. I think I just, you know, no tie, blue jeans and sneakers. And I show up and, every, and every, I realize real quick, everybody else is in their, in, you know, suit and tie. Everyone's looking nice and sharp. And that, that's how you realize real quick how important it is to, to dress up a little bit for a wedding. And of course, the pastor comes over and he said these words to me. Friend, how came this thou hither now having a wedding garment? And I had the same reaction. <laughs> Speechless, right? But he's showing us here that, you know, we have to have this special garment on to be part of that feast, to come before God's throne. And, of course, he says in verse 13, Then said the king unto the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away, and cast him out in outer, outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And again, he called him friend, and it wasn't because he says, This guy's not good enough. This guy isn't up to my standards. The guy just didn't have the right garment on. He could have been a terrible, lousy person. He could have been the worst uh, person in society and still been allowed if he just had on the garment. So it's not about how good, again, showing us, it's not good about how good we are to go to heaven. It's about whether or not we've got the garment on, right? And, that, you know, uh, we as New Testament believers, we wear a spiritual garment today. Of course, we can't see that. You know, sorry, Mormons. You know, you can take off magic underwear. That's not what it's referring to. <laughs> they wear magic underwear, by the way. <laughs> I've had one come to the door wearing it. <laughs> I mean, he had pants on too, but it goes all the way. It's like this leotard type of thing. And I didn't realize that at the time that my partner was like, man, that guy had his magic underwear on. And it was, anyway, I'm going on. I think we, could, we could have fun with that one, but we're not going to. But if you would, keep something in Exodus and turn over to Romans chapter 13. We as New Testament believers, as New Testament priests in Christ, we have to have our special garments on. You know, just as that parable shows us. The Bible says in Ephesians, you're going to Romans 13, it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the powers of, not, of His might. Put on the whole armor of God. There is a garment that we need to put on today spiritually. You know, some of us aren't, you know, we might be saved, but are we wearing the armor of God? Are we ready to go out and do battle and fight for the Lord spiritually? They may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For Romans chapter 13, verse 12, where you are. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us cast off the, therefore, off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. 
Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to, lust, to fulfill the lust thereof. You know, part of putting on that special garment is you denying the flesh and walking in the Spirit, not giving in to these temptations. <clears throat> the Bible says in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters. Go ahead and turn over there to 19, chapter, Revelation 19. And as the voice of thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So there's, there's people in heaven wearing that special garment, wearing that fine linen. Look at verse 11. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness doth he judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he, came, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was closed, uh, closed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And his armies, which were in heaven, followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. You know, if you get to when we get to heaven, there's going to be a special garment that we only get to wear, that God's going to put upon us, that fine linen, and it's the righteousness of the saints. It's the it, 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 lit it will be a literal garment in heaven that we wear. It will be literal fine linen. That's what he's describing here. I mean, that's us there as saved believers. If you wonder, well, who are these people? that are, you know, uh, uh, following him uh, on white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That's me and you. That's a horse ride I'm looking forward to. Oh, yeah. You know, you get all excited about the carousel. You know, it goes around the pony that goes up and down. And you can ride the alligator and you can ride the, you know, the dragon and all these other ones. I'm looking at that forward to that one. That's giving me a ride you'll never forget. <clears throat> so we see that we as New Testament believers, we, ha we are made to have, be without blemish. And that we have this spiritual garment on. But not only that, we are also have to be purified by blood. This is something else that we see in the Old Testament saints, or the Old Testament priests. And if you would, turn back to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29. We should never read the Old Testament and think, well, what was the point of all this? Or think it's just old news, it doesn't apply today. Everything in there is a picture of something to come. And we, I was talking to a gentleman just recently about all the different, just the, the amount of symbology that's in the Old Testament. The amount of things you could just read over and over again, how deep it goes. All the different things you can see that are a representation of Christ and a representation of the church and, and things to come. It's, it's very deep. And, uh, you know, Exodus 29, verse 19 shows us some, uh, that we have to be purified by blood just as they were back then. It says in Exodus 29, verse 19, and thou shalt take the other ram and Aaron and his sons and, put, and, and uh, shall put their hands upon the head of the ram. Then shalt thou kill the ram and take of his blood and put it on the tip of the right ear of Aaron and upon the right tip of, of the ear of his sons and upon the right of the thumb, uh, a thumb of their right hand and upon the great toe of their right foot and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And thou shalt take of the blood that is upon the altar and the anointing oil and sprinkle it upon Aaron and upon his garments and upon his sons and upon the garments of his sons with him. And he shall be hollowed and his, or hallowed, and his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. I mean, how would you like that? I said, hey, I got to do this, and just start throwing, you know, some animal's blood on you. You know, that's what had to happen to Aaron and his, and his, uh, in the priesthood. They had to take the that that ram and kill it, and take that ram's blood and sprinkle it upon him and upon the garments and around the altar. They had to put it on his and his right ear and his right thumb and his right toe. He had to be sanctified by the blood, or he could not fulfill that office of a priest. And that's the same way with us today. If we want to go before the throne, if we want to stand before God, if we want to act as priests today, spiritually speaking, we have to have that blood applied. We have to have been washed in the blood as well. Go to, and turn over to Hebrews chapter 10, where we were. Hebrews chapter 10. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. You know, the ram's blood is corruptible. You were not redeemed with, with corruptible things, as silver and gold from your vain uh, conversation received by tradition of men, or tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. I mean, that blood could not make the comers thereunto perfect, that ram's blood. I mean, it was a picture of things to come. The fact that if we want to be priests today, we have to be sprinkled with the blood of the lamb, that of Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. 
Go down to verse 29. Of how much sore punishment shall ye uh, suppose ye shall be thought worthy who hath trodden under the foot of the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So what are we sanctified by? The blood of the covenant. And whose blood is that? The blood of Jesus Christ through his sacrifice, through his offering. So we see that just as the Old Testament priest had to be sanctified by blood, we today as priests before God have to be sanctified by Christ's blood. We'll say, well, you know, and there's a lot of symbology there, but what's the point of it all? For us to understand that we have a priesthood today. That just as they had, a, 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 our priesthood today before God is every bit as real as, as Aaron and his sons were back then. I mean, they had no doubt about that they were priests when they're putting on garments, when they're being sprinkled by blood, when they're offering the sacrifice to God. Do you think they had any doubt whether or not that was real? But I wonder today how many, how many even New Testament believers, Christians, understand the fullness of what it means to be a, a priest, that we are made unto God priests and kings in the earth. And the priest of the, of the believer grants us great privilege. I mean, wouldn't you say that was a privilege for them back then? I mean, every time I fire up the barbecue and I'm throwing burgers on, I'm thinking, we should probably rethink this Levitical priesthood thing. <laughs> you know? But then I remember they couldn't eat pork. I'm like, well, if I can't barbecue a pig, forget it. You know? I mean, they, they came with privileges, didn't they? They, they? they were put in a place of honor. People looked at them. They, they got to wear these garments. They got to do a service nobody else could do. We're privileged today, too, as New Testament believers. And it's for everybody. Anybody can become one today if they have the right genealogy, if they're in Christ. <clears throat> and that great privilege is not that we can just stand in some tabernacle built by man's hands and offer you know, animals on some altar. We get to come before the very throne of God himself. Maybe we can't see it. Maybe we can't uh, uh, behold it with our physical eyes. But it's every bit and more so, a hundred times over, more glorious than anything those Levitical priests saw. Way more glorious than anything they saw in the tabernacle. Way more beautiful than anything they saw in the, in the, uh, in, in the temple. The gold and the jewels and all of it are as nothing when we, when we start to understand the, full, uh, the, the throne of God. That's whose throne we become from, come for. We don't just go into some tabernacle somewhere. That we're actually going before the very throne of God. That's the access that we have as New Testament priests, believers in Him. The Bible says in Matthew 27, verse 50, uh, when Christ had, had given, uh, cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. I mean, what's the symbology of that? That, that veil in the temple, that was that, that, that final barrier from the holy to the holiest of holies that only the high priest could go into once a year to offer sacrifices for sin. And he had to make sure his heart was right, that he was sanctified, and he, his own sacrifices had to be made before he ever went in there. And when Christ died, the Bible says that that, that, and it wasn't that somebody got up on a ladder and started cutting it with scissors. It just supernaturally, God just reached down and just tore that thing. That's, a symbol, that's symbolic, that that veil between us and God has gone away in Christ that through his blood, that through his sacrifice, we as priests can enter into the holiest of holies and, uh, and offer sacrifices and praise before God, spiritually speaking. That's the privilege that we have. That's the importance of this doctrine. Oh, the Baptist acronym. Oh, here we go again, another series. Priesthood of the believer. It's a powerful thing to think about that we can go before the very throne of God Almighty. That we don't have to go through some man. That we have to go raise, you know, buy some ram or some sheep or some ox or some bullock somewhere and carry, you know, take it to some specific place and shed its blood and have some man go on our behalf. And even then understand that that could make us perfect. But that we can just go right past all that, go right past the altar, go right by past the priest, go right in the holy, uh, the holy place and go right through that veil that's, that's on the floor today and walk right up into that, spiritually speaking, of course and offer our sacrifices to God. And God will hear us, and God will answer us. The Bible says in Ephesians 2, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together, to, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's where our seat is today. It's in heavenly places in Christ. That's a wonderful thought. And what is the purpose of all that? So that we could, is it just so that we could sit back and just say, well, we're priests. Look at us. We're really something. I mean, it's great. It's a privilege. We should feel that way. We should feel very 
privileged to be able to, to, to say that about ourselves. But the reason why that is is so that we can perform a duty. It was the same way with the priests back then. They had a job to do. It wasn't just so they could stand around wearing the special garments and say, look at me, everybody. I'm a priest. And everyone, oh, just, you're so great. No, they had a job to do. They had work to do. Right? They had to slay those animals. They had to sprinkle the blood. They had to, they had to do things that God demanded of them. And we have to do some of those same duties today, spiritually speaking. That's the spiritual application that's made today. If you would, turn over to uh, Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. We have spiritual duties as priests today. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 4, the Bible says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him, him which is, is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, and him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto our God, unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. When you got saved, friend, when you got washed in that blood, when your sins were washed away in the blood of Christ, that's not all that happened, is that your sins were forgiven. That you were made a king, and you were made a priest unto God, his Father, and our Father. So that's what we have to do today. We have to act as priests, spiritually speaking. And what does priests do? They offer sacrifices. And our job today as New Testament believers, as, priests, as New Testament priests in Christ, is to offer spiritual sacrifices. You know, don't let me hear about any of you guys going out after the sermon and, and, and start you know, offering you know, sacrifices at some altar somewhere. Well, Brother Corbin said we've got to offer sacrifices. I went and got me a goat. You know? <laughs> Now, if you want to go get a goat and, and have a, a little cookout, just make sure you invite me. Right. All right, but just, just don't let me, you know, I don't want to see you sprinkling blood anywhere, okay? <laughs> but we're going to offer spiritual sacrifices. As it says in 1 Peter, chapter, uh, 1 Peter, it says, As newborn babes desire the sincere, sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, even so, uh, even so be ye have tasted the Lord is gracious to whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. That's what we are. We are in holy priesthood. To do what? To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto uh, God by Jesus Christ. And, you know, we talked about this a little bit this last Thursday night when we were going through the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 2. You know, we're to offer up sacrifices, and what those are, referring to are, spiritually speaking, are prayers and intercessions. And, and supplications. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, I exhort therefore all that, that all, uh, first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. You say, well, what's the sacrifice I'm supposed to make today? Well, sacrifice your time and intercede for others. That's what the Old Testament priest did. He was interceding on behalf of the people. He was just acting as a mediator between God and men. He was the one that was doing all that work. Well, we should do that spiritually speaking. We should be praying for the lost. We should be praying for our loved ones. We should be praying for one another within the church, our, our brothers and sisters in Christ. We should be interceding and pleading and going before the throne of God and making that kind of a spiritual sacrifice. <clears throat> the Bible says that you know, it shows us that all, that all of this is made possible by the blood of Christ. I mean, that's the, you say, well, what a wonderful standing that we have, that we can, we can come boldly before the throne of God that we can we can make prayer that we can offer spiritual sacrifices for one another that we can make supplications we can make intercessions we can pray for one another and others that we know and others that are lost that we can go and perform this spiritual duty that we have and what a, a really an important job that it is and we talked about first when we were going through it last Thursday about first Timothy he says first of all I exhort there first of all supplications prayer and intercessions be made for all men for kings and all that are authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life he said first of all you know, and that's the thing that we probably gets neglected the most by most Christians is prayer. I mean, because no one sees it, or at least they shouldn't. I mean, see, Jesus said, go into your closet and pray. You know, and, and that when you have done, uh, that your Father may reward thee openly. And not to be like the hypocrites, not to be like those that's, that love the, the praise of men and to stand in, in the marketplace and make long prayers for pretense so that people could just admire us and our, and our, our, our mighty prayer. You know, be part of the, the, the national prayer breakfast where they just get up and read off of a piece of paper and they call it a prayer. That's not prayer. Prayer is personal. Prayer is private. Prayer is unseen. Prayer goes unrecognized. And that's probably why a lot of Christians leave it off. 
Because pe a lot of times we, we just want to be recognized. If we're going to do something for God, we want somebody to notice. We don't want to just do it because we love God or because that's what God asks of us. <clears throat> that's why it goes un undone. But that's the thing that Paul said, first of all, supplications, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks. Prayer should be a major priority in life. It should be something that we schedule and it should be something we do. And you know what the great thing about it is? Amen. Is that you can pray at, any, at the drop of a hat. You don't have to go find the tabernacle somewhere and offer something and then you can talk to God. You can pray, you can pray anywhere. As New Testament believers, as, 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 as priests in Christ, I mean, you could pull into your driveway after a long road trip and just in your own mind say, thank you, Lord, Amen. for a safe ride home. Amen. And it, it's genuine. It comes from the heart. You know, you, you, we pray at, at anywhere, anytime, any place in our own heart. But there ought to be a time and a place where we, we go before the throne of God privately. Nobody else needs to know about it. And there we make spiritual sacrifices on the behalf of other people as priests before God. <laughs> That's the privilege that we have, and it's all made possible by the uh, blood of Christ. If you would, turn over to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. I'll remind us of Hebrews 10 where it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest of the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and a body washed with pure water. And he's saying, look, we should have boldness to enter in to the holiest by the blood of Christ. Say, well, I don't think I'd, I deserve to go before the throne of God. You don't. None of us do. But that's the privilege that we have through the blood of Christ. That we can go through His blood, through that veil, through His flesh, and make our uh, petitions known unto God. The question is, are we taking advantage of our position as priests? So that's a beautiful thing to think about. Wow, it's, it's so inspiring. It's a, I never thought about it that way, that we're priests in a God. Well, we are, but here's the question. Are you taking advantage of it? Are you doing something with it? Or, or is the prayer closet empty day in and day out? Or do prayers go unsaid? Are we coming to our high priest in heaven? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You know, there's nothing you can bring before God that he doesn't know about, that he's not familiar with, because he came and lived among us. He was tempted in all points like as we are. You know, I'd, tell God, I'd go pray and tell God about this. I'd go and intercede or I'd go make a supplication. But you know, I don't think he'd understand. But here's the thing, he would understand. I mean, it says he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. There's no temptation there you're going to feel that Christ himself didn't feel. Look, being tempted by sin is not sin. Right? It's when we give in to that sin. When a man is tempted and he's drawn away of his own lust. When he's enticed. And when sin hath conceived, then it brings forth death. It's not just being tempted, oh, I'm, I'm in sin. You know, that's your flesh. That's your infirmity of your flesh. It's the devil. It's when we give in to that. He was tempted in all points, like as we are, yet without sin. He was tempted, but did he ever give in to it? Never, not one time. So when we go before the throne of God, when we have a burden, when we have a need, whether it's with sin, whether it's with some, we need something from God, whatever it is, there's nothing that you can say to him that he doesn't know about and understand. He can feel, he, you know, it says there that he can feel our infirmities. He can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You have some burden for somebody or some situation. He can feel that. He knows what that's like to have family members that reject Christ. He knows what that's like to be despised and rejected of men. He knows what that's like. And he says he was into all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace and help, to help in time of need. I love how it just keeps using that same word over and again boldness therefore brethren having therefore brethren boldness to enter in the holiest by the blood of christ let us come boldly under the throne of grace you say don't come timidly don't come in there like oh i know i don't deserve to be here lord but i just got a few these few things i'd like to ask of you and, you know <laughs> like a little kid who wants to get something from dad but is afraid to just come out and say it you know hey dad you think later maybe you know what he's saying come boldly 
Lord, I need you. Supplications, what is that? That's, that's crying, that's begging. Dear God, help me. I'm crying out to God. I have this need, I have this burden, I have this loved one. Whatever it is, come boldly with that. Why? Because you're a priest in Christ. You're made, by, you're made nigh by the blood of Christ. That's the, that's, the, that's the privilege that you have in Christ. To come boldly before His throne. And we leave that off so often, don't we? We leave that undone. You know, that, like the song says, what a friend we have in Jesus. All, all our sins and grief to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. What peace we often forfeit, right? Why? Because we do not take everything to God in prayer. So often we just bear our burdens. The prayers never get answered because we never pray them. And we could take all of those things to God boldly before His throne. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You need help with something? It's there. But you have not because you ask not. Ask and ye shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened to you. Seek and ye shall find. That's the privilege that we have today. As priests, we can make supplication not only for others, uh, but ourselves as well. We can come to a high priest with our needs and make all of our, 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 uh, all our needs known to, before God, before His throne, boldly. But are we? We should be. Let's go ahead and pray.